open your Bibles to Proverbs 30. Proverbs chapter 30. You know, ever so often, people will call the Bible the good book. And I certainly do agree the Bible is a good book. But I think the Bible is better than that. I think the Bible is better than any other book you might compare with it. I think the Bible is better than all of the books you can compare, compare with it. The Bible isn't just a good book, and the Bible isn't just a better book. The Bible really is the best book. But of course, we're in a series of sermons on better things in Proverbs, so the title is, of the sermon is The Better Book. Uh, notice what is said about the Bible here in Proverbs chapter 30. Look at verses 5 and 6. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. Do not add to His words, or He will rebuke you and prove you a liar. And we need to think a little bit about the context in which that statement is made. You know, a lot of times when we think about Proverbs, we think that Solomon is the author of Proverbs. And Solomon did write a lot of the Proverbs that are found in the book of Proverbs, but he's not the one who put the book of Proverbs together. Remember Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 1? It says, These are more Proverbs of Solomon compiled by the men of Hezekiah king of Judah. Now Solomon reigned as king over Israel from about 1070 to 1030 B.C., for about 40 years. But Hezekiah, who's the king described here, whose men collected these Proverbs of Solomon, he reigned as king of Judah from about 715 until 686 B.C., so a few hundred years after Solomon. So clearly, even though Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs in the book of Proverbs, He's not the one who put it all together and published the book. And so at the end of the book of Proverbs, whoever it was that put it all together, he added a couple of more collections of Proverbs. So chapter 31 are some Proverbs that were written by a guy named King Lemuel. We don't know who King Lemuel was. And Proverbs 30 contains some Proverbs that were written by a man named Agur. And again, we don't know any more about this guy, who he was. But notice what Proverbs 30, verse 1 says. The sayings of Agur, son of Jakey, an inspired utterance. And when you look at Proverbs 30, and you understand that this is a collection of sayings, you're going to find if you just go through and you analyze it and you count it, there are 14 sayings that this guy, Agur, put together, that's put on at the end of the book of Proverbs, right? So the first of those sayings is verse 1 down through verse 4. The second is the text for the sermon. It's verses 5 and 6. The third is verses 7 through 9, etc., etc. All right, so, so what I want us to see is that verses 5 and 6, you know, every word of God is flawless. He's a shield to those who take refuge in Him. That's a saying that this guy Agur wrote. But notice how Agur describes this saying. Look again at verse 1. The sayings of Agur, son of Jakey, now the NIV says an inspired utterance. Your translation may say an oracle, and that's a good translation, but the updated NIV translates that word an inspired utterance because that's what an oracle is. You see, this word oracle it's found in other places like Isaiah 13, verse 1, for a prophecy that Isaiah gives concerning the future of Babylon. And, and lots of other places for prophecy. So what's meant by this word oracle is this is something that has been given to Agur by God. This is an inspired utterance. This is a word of God. And so what I want us to see is verses 5 and 6 is a word of God about the word of God. It is an inspired statement about the inspiration of the Bible. So you want to know what God says about His Word? Here's what God says about His Word. 
Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is flawless. That's what God says about His Word. But you know, that's not all. What I want us also to see is that this is a quotation. Like this isn't the first time that those words, every word of God is flawless, He's a shield to those who take refuge in Him. That's not the first time that those words were written. Go back to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Now you know 2 Samuel is about David. And what is David known for? We're going to 2 Samuel 22. What is one of the main things that David is known for? He's known for writing songs, isn't he? He's known for writing psalms. And at the end of 2 Samuel, we've got two psalms that were written by David. And in 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 and 2, here's what we're told. These are the last words of David. The inspired utterance of David, son of Jesse, the utterance of the man exalted by the Most High, the man anointed by the God of Jacob, the hero of Israel's songs. Your translation may say the sweet psalmist of Israel. Either translation is possible. Here's what David said. The Spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. So whenever David wrote his songs, he was writing by inspiration. It was the Holy Spirit who was leading him to write what he wrote. Now go back to 2 Samuel 22. And with that in mind, notice verse 31. 2 Samuel 22, verse 31. Now this, this may all sound like a bunch of info, but we're going to put it together here in a second. So, so don't drop off. 2 Samuel 22, verse 31. As for God, David writes, His way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in Him. Now, have you seen those words before? Yeah, those, those are the words that we find in our text. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Now, granted, that first line, as for God, His way is perfect. Agur didn't quote that. And granted, Agur calls God, God, rather than Yahweh. But Agur, in Proverbs 30, verse 5, he is writing what David wrote a few hundred years before about the Word of God. David, by inspiration, wrote, As for God, His way is perfect. The Lord's Word is flawless. He shields those who take refuge in Him. God wrote, uh, moved David to write that. And then, God moved Agur to quote that. So here, here's what I'm building up to. This statement about every word of God is flawless, that is a statement that is doubly inspired. It was inspired by God when David wrote it, and then Agur was inspired by God to write it. And so this is a word of God about the word of God about the word of God. This is, this is God moving Agur to quote David's word about the word of God that God moved David to write. So in other words, the word of God is doubly, triply inspired and sure. The word of God is not just a good book. The word of God is better than that. It's a better book. But the word of God isn't just a better book. The Word of God is the best book. And so let's think about what kind of Word the Word of God is. Three things I want us to see this morning. We want us to see that it's a divine Word. We want to see, number two, it's a dependable Word. And then third place, we want to see that it's a delivering Word. All right? So notice, number one, it's, it's a divine Word. Look at verse 5 again. Every Word of God. Every Word of God. Now, if you go into my library and you look on the shelves, you see books. And you're going to see the spine of the books. And when you look at the spine of the books, at the top, you've got the title of the book. And then at the bottom, you've got the publisher of the book. And, and by the way, uh, well, and then in the middle, you've got the author of the book, right? And so this is a new cover on this Bible. My old cover was starting to wear out, so I had it rebound. But used to, when this had the original cover on it, it had the title of the book at the top. It said, Holy Bible. 
And then it had the publisher at the bottom, Zondervan. But there was a blank space in here. Where most books have the author, there was a blank space on the original cover. But you know, you could have filled that blank space in with God. Where most books have the author, you know, Grudem or Cox or whatever, you could have put on this God. Because this is the Word of God. Proverbs 30 verse 5 says, Every word of God is flawless. Now sometimes, you know, we say, well, you know, the Bible is made up of 66 books that were written by about 40 different people. And you may wonder, well, 66 books written by 40 different people, how, how do you get that math? Well, sometimes one person wrote multiple books, like Moses wrote five books and Paul wrote 13 books. So that's how you get 66 books written by about 40 different people. But it's no contradiction to say, even though we recognize that human beings were the penmen, the human beings who penned the books of the Bible, they were just intermediaries. Actually, God is the one who moved them to write what they wrote. Now, now look at an illustration of that. Go back to Proverbs 45. And we could notice this from a lot of different places, but go back to Proverbs 45. Psalms 45. Good luck finding Proverbs 45. That was a test. That wasn't my mistake. That was just a test. Go back to Psalms 45. So when you look at Psalm 45, you see that there's a title to it, right? For the director of music, to the tune of lilies, of the sons of Korah, a mascal, a wedding song. All right, so you see that phrase, of the sons of Korah? That lets you know who wrote the song. Remember, Korah who led the rebellion in Numbers chapter 16 against Moses' leadership, and Korah was wiped out. Well, some of his descendants survived. And some of his descendants wrote some of the psalms that are in the book of Psalms. And this is one of them. And when you look at this psalm, you see that this is a psalm that's it's classified as a royal psalm. This is a psalm that praises the king, praises one of David's descendants on the occasion of that king's wedding. All right? Now notice, notice how it begins. Psalm 45, verse 1. My heart is stirred by a noble theme. As I recite my verses for the king, my tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. Now that's what this author, the son of Korah, that's what he was thinking at the time. He was looking at the wedding of this descendant of David, this king of Judah, and as he was thinking about the wedding of the king of Judah, his heart was stirred by this noble theme. And so he, he's thinking, as he's writing, he's writing what's on his heart. His heart is stirred by this noble theme. But then drop down in it and look at verses 6 and 7. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Now, we don't have time to turn and look at it, but you might write beside that Hebrews chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And in Hebrews 1, verses 8 and 9, if you look at it, this passage is quoted. And you know what Hebrews 1, verses 8 and 9 says of this passage? It says God said that. God said that. Now, the psalm begins with this son of Korah saying, My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite verses for the king. My tongue is the tongue of a skillful writer. It's not as though the son of Korah is just sitting there and is just having this psalm dictated to him. And he's just writing down what God is dictating in his ear. No, no, this is what he's thinking at the time. This is what he's feeling at the time. And yet what he writes, as he's writing what he's feeling, as he's writing as his heart is stirred, what he writes, verses 6 and 7, Hebrews 1, verses 8 and 9 quotes and says, God said that. Because you see, who is it that's stirring his heart? It's God. God the Holy Spirit in him that's stirring his heart. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Look at verses 20 and 21. 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. 
Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For the prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And you see, that's what's going on. God the Holy Spirit is working in the heart. In, in the example of Psalm 45, God the Holy Spirit is stirring his heart. And it may feel to the psalmist as though what he's writing are the thoughts of his own heart. But really what he's writing is what the Holy Spirit is superintending for him to write. What he's writing is what the Holy Spirit is moving his heart to write. And that's true for all the Bible. So whenever we read passages like Paul, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 1, and Paul's going through and he's talking about who he baptized and he lists a couple of people who he baptizes and he says, besides that, I don't remember whether I baptized any others. You know, and it sounds like Paul's just writing from his own heart. Well, he's not just writing from his own heart. He is writing from his own heart, but he's writing what God is moving him to write. And God is giving him all the information that God wants him to write down, and he's restricting from him all the information that he doesn't want him to write down. And so this is a human book, but it's more than that. It's God's book. And everything that the writers write are what God moves them to write. And so it's a divine word. But then point number two, I want us to see that it's a dependable word. Go back to Proverbs 30. And look at verse 5 again. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is flawless. Every word. So if, if you just go through the Bible and you look at it word by word, and after you've looked at each word, then you start putting the words together. You look at two words at a time, and three words at a time, and a sentence at a time, and you just go through every single one of the words that are found in the Bible. And you examine it closely. At the end of the day, what you're going to find is every word of God is flawless. There's not a mistake to be found. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, I'm not sure about that. Because you're reading from the NIV, and I grew up on the King James Version. And the NIV and the King James Version are very different. So how do you explain the changes in the NIV and the King James? If the Word of God is flawless, why would you come up with something new? Why would you need new translations? So you've got to understand what Proverbs 30 verse 5 is saying and what it's not saying. Now we all know that the Bible was not written in English. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew in the main, portions of it written in Aramaic. The New Testament was written in Greek. And so I'm not saying that English translations of the Hebrew and the Greek Old Testament and New Testament are flawless. I believe the translations, though generally reliable, they've got flaws in them. But what I'm saying is what the prophets and what the apostles originally wrote I'm saying whenever Moses was writing Genesis, what he wrote down on that original manuscript, that was flawless. And whenever Matthew was writing his gospel account, what he wrote down on that original manuscript, that was flawless. Now, we've got to understand that you couldn't copy something exactly until the photocopy machine was invented in 1949. And you couldn't mass print anything until the printing machine was invented in 1450. Prior to that time, for a, a book of the Bible to be copied, it had to be copied by hand. You'd have a scribe sit down with his exemplar manuscript and a blank piece of paper and a pen, and he, and he, had, to, he had to copy word by word, letter by letter, had to copy by hand. And you know, that's tedious. And mistakes happened. You know, I mean, glasses weren't invented until, I think, the 1370s. And so don't you know some scribes had astigmatisms? You know, they, they were using oil lamp. They didn't have the good lighting that we had. So, so mistakes happened as the copies were made. So I, I'm not claiming that English translations are flawless. I'm not claiming that there is any one manuscript of the Bible that was copied out by hand that's flawless. But what Proverbs 30 verse 5 is saying, and what I'm saying, 
is that what the prophets and the apostles originally wrote, that's flawless. And anytime somebody comes along and they say, no, you know, I don't, I don't think that's right. I think there's a flaw there. And that person feels like they need to add a qualifying statement in order to correct the flaw. Or when everybody, somebody reads the Bible and they say, okay, well, you know, I don't think that's quite enough. I think we need to say more. And so they, they add something more to the Bible in order to add to it to overcome a flaw. What I think happens is exactly what Agur says here. Look at verse 6. Do not add to his words. His words are flawless. Do not add to his words. Not a qualifying statement, not an extra sentence, not an extra chapter, not an extra book. Do not add to his words or he will rebuke you and prove you a liar. Because his word is flawless. His word is true. And anything we would add to it would be a lie. Now a lot of people have come along and they've said, well, you know, I think I found an error in the Bible here. Or I think I found an error in the Bible there. I think that we need to have more confidence in the God who inspired the Bible than what we should have in the critic who finds an error in the Bible or even in ourselves whenever we think we found an error in the Bible. Because let me tell you what I've learned. I, I mean, I've been studying the Bible carefully for 25 years or more. I can't do math quick. I'd have to take my shoes off to figure out exactly how long. But, but I'm still learning. I don't know it all. And there have been things that I found earlier on in my time studying the Bible that I thought, well, that, that's not right. I, I, I just don't quite know how to understand that. And after a few more years of study, going deeper into it, I found the answer. And it was so simple. And I want to read to you a quote from a guy named Wayne Grudem. Now, Wayne Grudem is the guy who stands behind the English Standard Version. Anybody know, anybody use the English Standard Version? It's a great translation. It's a more literal translation. But Wayne Grudem, he's the one who, who got permission to do the English Standard Version, and he's the one who, collect, who uh, put together the team that translated the English Standard Version. He's a PhD from Cambridge. I mean, I've got some theological differences with him, but he is a, he is a top shelf scholar. He knows Hebrew, he knows Greek, he's good with the original languages, and here's what he wrote. Quote, The present writer, for example, has during the last 20 years examined dozens of these problem texts. And what he's talking about are these passages where people say, hey, there's an error there. There's a contradiction there. There's a problem there. So, so I've looked at dozens of these problem texts, he says, that have been brought to his attention in the context of the inerrancy debate. In every one of those cases, upon close inspection of the text, a plausible solution has become evident. And so he says, people, people have brought to me lots of problems, but as I've looked at it very carefully, he said, I don't think any of those problems actually stand. And so I believe the Bible is a dependable word. Every word of God is flawless. Now quickly, let's move to our third point. And our third point, what kind of word is it? It's not just a divine word. It's not just a dependable word. But it is a delivering word. Look again at the text. Verse 5. Every word of God is flawless. He, now the he there refers to God. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. So anytime somebody sees danger and they realize that they're no match for the danger, they seek refuge. And so God says anytime you see a spiritual danger and you run to me for refuge, I'll take, I'll shield you and protect you from that danger that you seek refuge from. Now, in this particular context, how is it that we seek refuge in God? 
Well, the context is the Word of God. Every Word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in Him. So the idea here is we take refuge in God in this passage by hearing God's Word, believing God's Word, and obeying God's Word. That's how we take refuge in God. Have you ever noticed in Scripture the close connection between God and His Word? Let me show you a couple of verses. Look first at Genesis 2. Genesis 2. So Genesis 2, God creates a woman for Eve. For Eve. One of, no, He did not create it. No. Scratch that. Not true. False. He, crea <laughs> he created a woman for Adam. Oh, man. That could be clipped and misused, couldn't it? Okay. We got to move on. Verse 23, so God, God brings Eve to Adam. And Adam says, the man says, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. So that's Adam's word. And look at the very next verse, verse 24. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Now, Adam did not say that. Adam did not say that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam didn't have a father or a mother. Who wrote that? Who wrote the word, the statement, after Adam's statement? Well, Moses wrote that. That's Moses' comment. Moses is giving a basis for marriage. And so that's Scripture's statement. But notice how Jesus explains the origin of that statement, Genesis 2.24. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 19. Matthew 19. Look at verse 4. Jesus asks, Haven't you read, He replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said... So He's quoting God. God said... For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So, so here, what Scripture says in Genesis 2.24, Jesus says God said. What Scripture says God said. And you know what? What God says, Scripture says. Put together two more passages. Go back to Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9. So Exodus 9, verse 13, God gives Moses instructions as to what he's to say to Pharaoh. And here is what God tells Moses to say to Pharaoh. So this is what God is saying to Pharaoh. Look at verse 16 of Exodus 9. But I, God speaking, I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So that's what God said. But notice what Paul says about that. Look at Romans chapter 9. Romans 9. Look at verse 17. Romans 9, 17. Romans 9, 17. For Scripture says to Pharaoh... Did Scripture ever speak to Pharaoh? Pharaoh never had Scripture. God spoke to Pharaoh through Moses. God said that. But Pharaoh never had Scripture. But notice, Romans 9, verse 17, For Scripture says to Pharaoh, quote, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. He's quoting Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. So what Scripture says, God says. Genesis 2, 24 Romans, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 19, verse 5. And what God says, Scripture says. Exodus chapter 9, verse 16. Romans chapter 9, and verse 17. How you treat Scripture is how you treat God. Look at 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel 12. David. He had Scripture, didn't he? 
He had the sixth commandment that says you shall not commit murder. He had the seventh commandment that, th that said you shall not commit adultery. And what did David do? Even though he had those two commandments, he committed adultery and then he committed murder. And notice what God said to David through the prophet Nathan. 2 Samuel 12, look at verse 9. God asked David, Why did you despise the word of the Lord? By doing what is evil in his eyes. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. You despised the word of the Lord. You broke the sixth and the seventh commandments. Now look at what's said in verse 10. Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own wife. You see, there's this close connection between God and Scripture. What Scripture says, God says. What God says, Scripture says. The way we treat Scripture is the way that we treat God. If we neglect Scripture, we're neglecting God. If we obey Scripture, we're obeying God. And whenever we heed the warnings of Scripture, and we obey Scripture, and we follow Scripture, we are fleeing to God for refuge, and God becomes a shield, and that Scripture becomes salvation for us. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James 1 and verse 21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the Word. And that's Scripture. Humbly accept the Word planted in you which can save you. Scripture can save us. God saves us when we follow Scripture. And so what I want us to walk away from the sermon this morning believing is that this is the best thing that we have possession of. This is a divine Word. This is a dependable Word. This is a delivering Word. This is a Word that can be trusted in all that it says. And anytime I come to Scripture and I think, I... I don't think I believe that because I feel this way. Don't doubt Scripture. Doubt yourself. Doubt your feelings. Our feelings can be wrong. Our beliefs can be wrong. But Scripture is not wrong. And if we really want to have a relationship with God, if we really want to be saved by God, the only way to do that is through this book. This is our access God. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, I plead with you. I beg you. If it would help, I would get down on my hands and knees. I ask you, please, today, get your life right to God. Don't leave here today without being saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You've sinned and you're in danger. Your sin will find you out. Your sin will destroy you for all eternity. Flee to God for refuge today. And the way to do that is by obeying Scripture. Trust that Jesus is the I Am, John 8, verse 24. Turn from your sin in repentance. God commands all people everywhere to repent, Acts 17, verse 30. Confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. Because we confess unto salvation, Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. And won't you be baptized in water today so that all your sins can be washed away? God's word to you is Acts 22, 16. What are you waiting for? Arise. Get yourself baptized. Get your sins washed away. Calling on the name of the Lord. If you're a Christian and you've strayed and you've got sin in your life, you need forgiveness for it. God's word to you is Acts chapter 8 and verse 24. Repent therefore of this your wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart might be forgiven. We can help you. Won't you please come? All together we stand and sing the invitation song. Christ alone, cornerstone, we made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He
when darkness seems to hide his face.